Today, I have the pleasure of having with me on the podcast, Evan Thompson, who is a professor of philosophy at the University of British Columbia and uh, an, an author of the book, Waking, Dreaming, Being, which is, um, I'll get to it in, in a moment of my little take on it, but uh, thanks for coming on the podcast. Thanks very much. Um, so let me, let, me get the, um, let me get the gushing out of the way, because... Uh, <laughs> Um, so we can get to the question and, and, and stuff that, that's more interesting to the audience as well. This this book is uh, is absolutely fantastic. I mean, you um, the the subtitle is Self and Consciousness in Neuroscience, Meditation, and Philosophy, which I, I don't think you could have included more words that I absolutely love and <laughs> subjects that I find fascinating. Um, so uh, the thing about the book is that you. Uh, you do have a, a, a major point that you're trying, I think, to convey about the sense of self and consciousness and experience, um, but you take us along through uh, the experiences of waking, dreaming, and, 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 and being in general, and through sort of Indian uh, and Buddhist philosophy, uh, as well as neuroscience and your own experience, and um, you do it absolutely in a remarkable way. I mean, all, all of the subjects throughout the book touch on one another and they sort of string along a, a story that's easy to read. Uh, even with the neuroscience and everything, it's very accessible. Uh, and it's just a, it's just a pleasure. Uh, so thank you for, for writing it. Well, I'm, I'm very happy to hear that that's your response to it. That, that's, uh, that's great. Thanks a lot. Absolutely. Um, so I want to jump into, uh, I have, of course, a bunch of questions and there's a lot we can touch on. I mean, just uh, we can take every chapter of the book and, and expand it to hours of discussion. Um, and, and I'll be honest, in preparing for this interview, uh, and I wrote down the questions, uh, a bunch of questions throughout reading this book over, over several months, um, it was really hard to try to create a, a sequence of questions that, that go through a, a coherent thing because, again, every, every question that I came up with and every, every subject I wanted to discuss with you Sort of touches on another, so this might conversation might be uh, all over the place, but some those are some of the most fun conversations. Sure, let's, let's give it a try. Um, I'm not going to ask you to, to give a whole your whole background. You 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 go at length at, at some other interviews, and I'm going to link to those in the show notes. Uh, but if you want to tell the audience just briefly about uh, yourself and what you do, and maybe take it from there into, I'm, I'm happy to jump uh, straight into lucid dreaming, and we'll touch upon. Uh, some science and philosophy a little bit later on. Um, so a little about yourself and your introduction to, to lucid dreaming. Uh, yeah. Um, well, as you mentioned, I'm professor of philosophy at University of British Columbia. So the, the areas that I work in are mainly philosophy of mind and <clears throat> cognitive science. I work a lot with um, collaboratively with neuroscientists who investigate consciousness and self. Um, my first degree was in Asian studies, and so I have a long-standing interest in Asian philosophy, especially Indian and Buddhist philosophy, and I've been involved with different kinds of contemplative meditative practices over the years. Um, as a kid in the 1970s, I grew up in an organization that my parents founded um, called the Lindisfarne Association, and that brought together um, contemplative teachers, scientists, poets, artists, it was a kind of alternative institute and community. And so from a very young age, I was exposed to a lot of different ideas coming from science and philosophy and art, um, a lot of different approaches to religion and, and spirituality, contemplative practice. So that background kind of just informs um, everything that's going on in Waking Dreaming Being. It's a, it's a kind of a synthesis of my work as a philosopher, my work as a cognitive scientist, and my own ongoing personal exploration, you could say, of things like lucid dreaming, meditation, um, out of body experiences. There's a range of things that I that I cover in the book. Very cool. Uh, and in fact, um, uh, I think that part of what I love is that your uh, your book includes a lot of your own or, or a good amount of your own perspective and your own experience. You don't just talk about it sort of academically or or scientifically, uh, but you but you bring your, yourself and your own experiences into it. And and uh, speaking about your background as well. Um, the, the, the name, the title, I think it's not a coincidence that the first time I heard the title, it reminded me of a title of one of the first books I've ever picked up on this general subject, uh, which is out of the Mind and Life Dialogues, which I think was Waking, Dreaming, Dying. It was, um, I think it's Sleeping, sleeping. 
Screaming, dying. I forget yeah. now. Yeah. yeah, it's very similar. Very similar title. And that book, actually, that that mind and life dialogue. Um, which was edited and conducted by the neuroscientist Francisco Varela, who was um, someone that I met very early at the Lindisfarne Association and um, whom I collaborated with for many years up until his death in 2001. We wrote a number of books and papers together. Um, so he organized that Mind and Life event. It was one of the early ones um, in Dharamsala in 1989 or 1990, I think. And it was on the theme of sleeping and dreaming and dying from the Tibetan Buddhist perspective and the and the neuroscience perspective. And so that book actually really was in the background very much when I was when I was writing Waking Dreaming Being. It really informed it. And it's my favorite of of all the mind and life dialogues that have been published. It, it's still, I think, to me, the most interesting one. It's it it really goes into the to the the heart of the of the Tibetan Buddhist thinking about sleeping and dreaming and dying, and then the the neuroscience. Um, uh, psycho Western psychology perspectives. Right. Yeah. It's it's uh, it, it is really good, and um, I think out of all of these uh, uh, meetings and dialogues, and, and of course a lot of uh, Varela's um, work, so much has came out uh, in terms of, of modern contemplative uh, uh, neuroscience and science in general. It's good stuff. Um, so okay. So. Uh, and feel free to to jump in with with anything particular that that you you have comments on anything I say, uh, not just answering my questions. But okay, sure. Uh, let me start with that. Um, I love your perspective on lucid dreaming not actually being a dissociated state, as uh, some research proposed. And I think pointing out that the waking state itself often lacks the self awareness, self reflective quality that lacks in a non lucid dream um, is a really great illustration. I think you, you laid it out really nicely uh, in the book. Uh, and again, you look at lucid dreaming uh, and dreaming in general as a sort of, as a intriguing state of consciousness um, in looking at, um, and again, this is where it all connects. I'm trying to sort of be coherent. Um, as it terms to how we, how we experience ourselves or how we see ourselves to be or the continuum of our conscious experience. Um, my, my question really is here is that um, what, why do you think there is such a, there's such a, a difference in, in, in opinion about how we, how we look at it? And I know that dreaming is, is something that most people day to day sort of, a lot of people at least ignore in, 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 in the West or it depends on the, the culture that you're in. Uh, mm -hmm. But in science, it's always been intriguing, especially as of late. I don't know if you have any comments on that. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, dreaming is, um, in terms of recorded uh, descriptions in in um, texts um, in human literature, dreaming is you know one of the oldest things that's that's talked about, um, going back into the Indian Upanishads, which I talk about in the book. Um, other texts, you know, the Old Testament, the Gilgamesh epic. I mean, dreaming is already in these earliest formative you know, texts that we have. And so I think it's, it's something that's inter inter interested us and fascinated us for a very long time. Um, I would say that it's especially interesting from a neuroscience perspective because in the effort to understand consciousness and the nature of awareness, you have, um, you have awareness and conscious in the absence of immediate perceptual coupling with the external world. You still, of course, are intimately perceptually coupled to your body introceptively and, and viscerally. So it's not as if the body is absent, but you don't have that kind of immediate um, extraceptive coupling to the world in the case of, of sleeping and dreaming. And, and yet you have this very you know robust, spontaneously generated um, mental activity. So from a neuroscience perspective, it it actually reflects on the fact that most of what the brain is about and what the brain is doing is its own endogenous, spontaneously generated activity. And that's the case in the waking state as well. It's just that there's this kind of closer coupling between that ongoing activity and um, an extraceptive activity. So it, prov it provides from a neuroscience perspective a pretty interesting window onto the, you know, the kind of self-organizing nature of brain activity. And then phenomenologically, of course, it's also a case in which the content 
is being generated in this auto auto generative way. So it's not as if what you dream is is dictated in any way um, by perception or by memory, though of course it relies on perception and memory. And of course that's true in the waking state too. You know, the the mind wandering reveries or daydreams that we have or the moments of insight that we have, those aren't in any way dictated by the immediate perceptual coupling with the environment either. So um, so those are some of the reasons why I think it's ex it's especially fascinating. Of course, you know, from the depth psychology perspectives, you know, Freud and Jung and so on, there's the idea that, that dreams um, are reservoirs of a kind of meaning that we don't have ordinary access to. So that would be another reason why dreams are, are you know, fascinating from the, from the perspective of modern psychology. I think you, uh, I'm, I don't remember you giving uh, your take on it. I could be wrong. Uh, I don't remember you giving your take on, on, on this particular part. So maybe you can, and feel free to speculate or to, to, not, to refuse to answer this question. Um, but um, do, you have, do you have a theory about, um, you know, why do dreams even exist? This is one of the questions I, I, I kept being asked by, by an audience member or people on forums and so on, or, and you see it everywhere. Um, and, and, you know, is there, is there a, other than like memory consolidation, which actually we know a little more that happens also in deep sleep, perhaps mm -hmm. more than, than, than REM sleep. Uh, maybe you have a, a take on that. I'm curious. Yeah. Um, well, I, I tend to not really be very persuaded or moved by the question whether dreams have a biological or an evolutionary function, um, which is one way that people pose the question that you just posed. It's, it, it, it's possible that they do that, you know, that's a, that's an open and interesting question from a, from the perspective of evolutionary biology. But the way that I think of it is a little different. I think of it, it rather as if you have the kind of um, let's say neural architecture that we have that is a highly complex brain that's evolved through especially the development of social interactions and reflective self-consciousness that most of what that brain well most of what that brain is doing is regulating the life of the body but if we think of it in terms of mind most of what the brain is about is a kind of auto generated stream of thought and um, some of that is conscious some of it isn't and so given that kind of a system it seems to me that dreaming is in a way to be expected there's no particular reason to think that if you go into sleep that that's going to that's going to shut down through all of through all of sleep rather you would expect that there'd be a kind of continuum where you have the the waking mentation and that carries over into sleep as you fall asleep and then um, takes the 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 form that it does in in dreams and even in deeper stages of of sleep. So that doesn't answer the question, you know, what are dreams for? Or why do we dream? But it it kind of turns things around. In maybe, I mean, one way to turn it around would be to say, well, you know, why wouldn't we actually um, have that kind of inner mental life and sleep and this is why the you know the Upanishads is so interesting as a historical and philosophical document and and why I begin the book with it is because it's one of the oldest accounts we have of how the mind moves through these states of waking and dreaming and sleeping and already there we have the idea that in sleep and in dreaming the mind is working with um, with memories and and it's still carrying on it's that the nature of the mind is is simply to move actually in the in the indian philosophical conception of mind the nature of mind is to move from one thing to the other and that is going to be what the mind does in sleep as much as in waking but in sleep what it's got to work with are the the traces of experience laid down through through memories yeah it seems like uh, imagination plus memory and in processing um, I mean, th that question really makes me think almost of, it, it feels like a similar question to why, why do we, why are we alive or why do we, you know, why does the universe exist almost? <laughs> um, and I was listening to a, a talk, I think by Sean Carroll, one of my favorite physicists, and he points out that there is, the, the, I don't know, a book or a catalog of, of philosophical answers and to the question, you know, why is there something instead of nothing? The first answer is, why not? I mean, the uh, you know, it's uh, it really depends on how we we kind of look at it. We we start from the fact that it is here, uh, and we're sort of trying to reverse engineering. 
Um, mm-hmm. The last thing I wanted to say about what you were saying uh, a point earlier that I find interesting about about dreams and also um, like you're saying, it's not that we um, sort of uh, actively created it. It's, it's self-generating or generating from some process uh, perhaps in the brain. Uh, but the interesting thing that, and I don't know if it's a good comparison to breathing, but something that sort of uh, is self-maintained, but you can have an effect. So in a lucid dream, uh, you do sort of often enough gain the ability to affect the dream or to create some things in it. And even just the attention that suddenly comes in a lucid dream that, uh, as opposed to a non-lucid dream has an effect. Like where you point your focus on in the dream affects what it seems to give, uh develop uh, from there yeah no I think that I think that's exactly right I think that um, that lucid dreaming you know some people when they talk about lucid dreaming they think that what's really significant about lucid dreaming is that you can in some ways control the dream and control is um, is in some ways a misleading concept because you can certainly affect the dream content um, in some ways, but in other kinds of lucid dreaming, you actually can't affect the dream content very much, but you do have the awareness that it's a dream state. And as you were saying, with the awareness that it's a dream state, you have the ability to attend to it as a dream. And that is already a way of affecting it, even if you can't in any way manipulate the content. Yeah, I, uh, I always, I, I usually- The very nature of attention is, uh, is, a, is affecting in that way. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, I usually point out that like I use affecting rather than control, but even if like in relative mm-hmm. control or a certain amount of control, even if you generate an object, you didn't consciously choose all the details on it and stuff like that. There is a, right. you know, exactly. So, yeah, that's um, right. All right. Let's see. Um, so there, there's you, uh, you talk about um, trying to figure out, um, you know, whether consciousness is sort of comprised of uh, discrete moments or is more uniform and we use waking people up from different stages of sleep to see also if they're if they have consciousness during deep sleep if they have memories from thoughts or or uh, I think that's why they they also discovered that there is perhaps dreaming in other sleep stages other than in REM uh, mm-hmm. and I'm wondering if 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 there's a way to know in the scientific studies when we wake people up and ask them what they remember or if they just experience something, if they're not actually remembering something from a previous sleep cycle, as opposed to from the one they were just woken up from. So if the sleep stage contains no content, but the one before it did, something some something might register from the last one they remember, as opposed to, I mean, do we know that it's, is there a way for us in those studies, like a clever way to know that what they seem to remember is from this particular sleep stage, as opposed to the previous one? So it's always been well, the idea is generally that when you wake someone at a particular moment and you elicit some report, that the content has to be um, held in that moment in order to be able to report it. So there is a question about um, whether that content is reflective, I suppose, of something that's immediately antecedent or whether it's a memory of something um, uh, more uh, at an earlier phase. But that is in some ways, I mean, that's an interesting question. But the general thinking is that when you you wake someone up from sleep, there's, well, it depends on what stage you wake them up. If you wake them up from very, from stages of very deep sleep, there's often a, a kind of disorientation and um, it, it's actually, it takes effort to respond and to report something. And the idea would be that um, what's going to be reported is really going to be um, something that's uh, most, um, I suppose you could say, evident or paramount in their in their sleep mentation. And that's, so that's very likely to have been whatever is, you know, has been most, has been most recent. Um, you can, um, with lucid dreamers, it's a little bit different because lucid dreamers report, very robust lucid dreamers report, and to my knowledge, there's not a lot of, you know, scientific investigation of this yet, but they report um, in dreams, being able to remember things from waking life, being able to remember previous lucid dreams, um, being able to remember transitioning from different kinds of sleep states. So there you have the potential of, um, 
memory reports that would reflect earlier uh, earlier cycles, I suppose you could say. But to my knowledge, that's really unexplored from a sleep science perspective because the few studies we have of lucid dreaming are really trying to just elicit a report about whether they were aware that they were dreaming or not. So that's in a way open, an open area for investigation. Yeah. I found, I found interesting. Um, one of my experiences, even in regular dreams where I have good dream recall and I'm, and I'm writing down in the morning several dreams, um, I have the sort of informational, like, uh, like um, you know, the, the metadata of, of the dream that tells me that at this point, one dream ended and another one continued, even if they seem seamless, even if there's like a transition between them, I can't even explain it. Something tells me when I'm writing down the dream and I remember it, that this was one dream and this was another. And I kept wondering if those are somehow a different um, sleep cycles, perhaps, or something like that. And I kept kept wondering about like, yeah, why, I, why mean, I have that. It's tricky because it's not it's not really um, obvious what the criteria are for saying this is one dream and this is another dream. Um, there's there's a pretty clear way in which we can talk about dreaming the duration of dreaming. So dreaming as an episode in which you know I was dreaming for you know such and such a period of time. But then how we break it up into into okay this was one dream this was another this is another that's actually tricky and and. Um, my own suspicion is that um, that has a lot to do with our cultural practices of narration and how we think of things in terms of stories and what counts for us as continuous and what counts for us as discontinuous. There's a, there's a um, passage I quote from a short essay by Borges in Waking Dreamy Being where Borges makes this point. He says that the waking reports often give a structure to a dream that the dream might not have had. And so he uses as an example, you know, first I, um, I have the image of a, of a tree and then I have the image of a man and that's my dream. And then I wake up and I might say something like, I dreamt there was a tree that then turned into a man. And so you make it into a story with a transformation. And that's because of, you could say, a certain tendency to narrate things in certain ways. Whereas um, a more, let's say, um, minimal description of the dream um, might not give it that kind of narrative structure. That's why it's interesting to work with people who are, um, let's say, trained in techniques of um, various kinds of mindfulness because they're the mental orientation is very much to just simply notice things as they arise from moment to moment and to register them but not necessarily to kind of cognitively embellish them in the way that might make them into something like a story. I mean, it might have been genuinely experienced as a story. That's, that's of course, we, we have dreams like that, but um, we also have practices of telling dreams and, and, and even writing dr a dream already as kind of a retrospective effort of you know, memory and, and um, structuring into the words on the page. And so that's, um, that's a kind of uh, structuring practice we have that, that, that makes the dream in terms of the dream report, which is really at the end of the day, all we actually have, makes it, makes it have a certain kind of structure or seem a certain kind of way. Yeah, waking memory is barely reliable. So yeah. <laughs> one from a fuzzy dream exactly. is not, That's right. not all that. Uh, um, if, uh, I mean, you, you were talking about it and I think you, you're well aware of how hard it is to get somebody in a lab to, uh, to sleep and, and, and have a lucid dream on, on a reliable basis. And um, I think Ursula Voss was talking in her lecture and saying that the first, before their 2009 study, it took them six months to get three recorded lucid dreams. Um, if, if, if lucid dreams were ubiquitous and easy, what, I'm curious to, to ask you, what, uh, what kind of studies would you like to see or, or propose to, to do? Well, I think... I mean, there's there's a number of of different kind of studies that I that I could imagine. That you know, the scientific community generally accepts now that lucid dreaming is a distinct phenomenon, whereas it might not have done so 30 or 40 years ago. So I don't think the effort to establish the fact of lucid dreaming would is is so, is so needed I think now. We're I think that, yeah. yeah, yeah. I think we're I think we're beyond that. So I think you know the kinds of things I'm interested in are. Um, 
the many people report that lucid dreams, especially when the lucidity seems very uh, intense, let's say that lucid dreams have a particular kind of hyper real quality that they're very um, sharp and clear. Um, they almost seem, you know, more real than real. And so it would be interesting to try to investigate the nature of that, uh, let's say, sensory clarity, whether it's a kind of in enhanced vividness or whether it's actually an enhanced detail or exactly what its relationship to attention is. So that would be one thing having to do with just the phenomenal qualities of, of lucid dreaming. Um, and then I think what would be especially interesting would be to investigate the possibility of, of transitional or liminal awarenesses as you go from, say, lucid dreaming into uh, deep sleep, which is much more difficult to investigate from a, a kind of neurophenomenological perspective. Um, or as you're coming out of sleep into a dream, that sense of emergence into a dream, if they're with uh, lucid dreamers, particularly who've kind of really worked um, perhaps through meditative traditions to train a certain kind of sleep awareness, um, whether they can report on those transitional liminal moments in a more um, precise way. That would be extremely interesting because it would potentially open up um, ways of, of tracking the, the formation and the dissolution of the dream, not simply just the quality of the dream in terms of its, its sensory imagery. So those are just some things. I mean, there, there are many more. Yeah. But... No, that's, that's fascinating. And um, I know that uh, um, dream yoga practitioners, experienced practitioners often use it not just to, you know, for spiritual practice and meditating in the dream or practicing bardos and so on, but also in, as, a, as a way to transition into clear light sleep or sort of uh -huh. uh, lucid sleeping, which is right. a, a fascinating phenomenon, which you, you touch upon, and I'm going to ask you something about it. Uh, so you do mention in the book the, um, the Hobson and Voss uh, study from 2009, I believe. <laughs> I'm guessing you're aware of the latest one, and I was wondering what you think about that, if you know about the one from, from last year. Uh, they're, which they're study are you thinking of? Uh, the, the one where they're trying to induce lucidity with... Uh, um, oh, yes. Current. Right. Yeah, that's an interesting study. Um, um, I mean, the idea that you could induce lucidity through, or you could you could bias people towards the greater likelihood of lucidity through yeah. those kinds of interventions is is interesting. Um, I don't think that um, you know that uh, simply being able to do that in the way that they did doesn't really tell us a lot about the nature of lucid dreaming from either a phenomenological or <clears throat> from a physiological perspective. Um, but it's an interesting finding. Um, you know, it's not, obviously it's not something people who are sort of, you know, lucid dream aficionados, it's, it's not a, a, a you know, a, a readily available method <clears throat> that you can use right. at home and yeah. um, <clears throat> not yet. And prob well, you know, um, maybe, maybe there'll be some, things coming out of that but it's kind of it's technologically pretty heavy what they had to do so in terms of the you know equipment required so um but it's it's an interesting study yeah it's an interesting study so I'm, I'm wondering because until i read your book i didn't realize that there were some there's some other studies that you mention of how various meditation practices affect sleep uh, physiology and brain waves and, yeah. and different meditations have different seems like have different effect which is I find fascinating. And I have two questions about that. One, uh, I was wondering, um, you know, if we know really when we're, when we're reading brain waves, and this is the, the again, the problem of, of trying to reduce uh, a subjective experience or, or consciousness state to brain waves and vice versa, which is problematic in all sorts of ways. Uh, but one, from reading those things, do we know? Do you know what? Do we know what they mean? Like, I think it was uh, either TM or one of those that seemed to people with more experience in, in that meditation exhibit as much deep sleep as younger people, like older people exhibit as much deep sleep as younger people, as opposed to people who are not experienced in meditation in an older age. Yeah. I mean, those findings are few, they're tantalizing. They need to be followed up with much more studies with um, very rigorous controls. So I would say that from the perspective of the effect of different types of meditation practices on sleep rhythms, um, we really know very, very little. Um, 
you know, there's there's some research that's starting to be done. Um, Giulio Tononi in, in, at the University of Wisconsin Madison and Richard Davidson at University of Wisconsin Madison are collaborating on investigating the effects of uh, meditation, pra Buddhist meditation practice, on sleep rhythms. They've published one study, um, but it's that's totally wide open. And the studies that I mentioned, looking at um, Let's see if I remember some looked at Theravada Vipassana, some looked at certain kinds of Indian yoga practice. Um, you know, it's suggestive evidence, but there's no way that we could really generate any kind of solid story off of off of that. Um, there's yeah. so many different factors involved in sleep. And, you know, the other thing I guess I would say about that is just that, um, you know, when you sleep in a sleep lab, that's a very different kind of context from when you sleep at home. <laughs> And cultures sleep differently. Um, you know, we have a particular relationship to sleep and, you know, the hyped up modern, stressful Western world is very different from other, you know, societies. So there's so many factors that go into shaping sleep physiologically and, and psychologically that um, I don't think we're in, really in any position yet to be able to say what the effect of meditation is on it. I mean, of course, people have lots of anecdotal evidence. They go on a you know, if a Pasana meditation retreat for 10 days, they notice how their sleep changes. Um, you know, all of that's quite, you know, important kind of anecdotal uh, material, but it's not, you know, it, it doesn't give us uh, a scientific story yet. Yeah, yeah, there's there's a couple of points on that. I mean, one, I, I love your sort of uh, a call or suggestion that, or the hopes that, that you know, uh, in the future, uh, at least sleep science can, can come out of the lab and go to as, a lot more people and in their more natural environments. So I'm very interested in sort of uh, more advanced like sleep trackers and, and things that can can work with uh, uh, research, but allowing people to sort of participate in their own in their own homes. And the last thing I wanted to say, and again, your your answer to that is, is probably the same as, as the the previous uh, comment about the Voss study. Um, that when I read that one of those, they saw that they're exhibiting gamma during deep sleep as well. Mm -hmm. uh, these uh, experienced meditators, I thought if they can, if they can sort of elicit the brain to induce that brainwave, and that might correspond to lucidity uh, in in while during REM. I wonder if the same thing can have an effect on you know lucid sleeping if it's induced in a particular way um, during deep sleep. But, yeah, yeah that's but, uh, that's a wide open thing. I mean, the one the one caution I guess I would say there is that um, the idea that that just the 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 presence of gamma frequency activity um, can't really be taken as an indication of uh, of lucidity or of awareness in general. It's it's one particular aspect of a complex brain rhythm and. You know, it's it's very interesting that in so that was a study done by by Davidson and Tononi that in long term Buddhist practitioners you see an increase in the proportion of of high gamma activity and slow wave sleep compared to non meditators. So that's you know potentially saying that the brain rhythms in deep sleep for meditators versus non meditators are different. Though it's not a longitudinal study, so it could be a pre existing difference. We don't we don't really know. Um, but I would be very hesitant about making any kind of simple correlation between gamma activity and lucidity because we i mean we already know that that, that gamma is involved in so many different things right. and it's just it's just one frequency where the sort of state of the art in neuroscience now is really looking at how these different frequencies modulate each other and couple with each other how the how the amplitude of one frequency is coupled to the phase of another um, across, you know, slow to um, to faster frequencies. So there's this whole kind of complex dynamical phase portrait that's really emerging as as a more relevant uh, measure. And and to my knowledge, that kind of analysis hasn't really been done for for uh, sleeping and 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 dreaming yet. So you know that'll right. change our picture a lot. Yeah, it's yeah. a fascinating area. Yeah, no, it is. That's right. And I know it's sort of cross-pollinating with uh, neurofeedback, which I know Judson Brewer mm -hmm. and, and many others are working on. So, I mean, what what comes out of that would be very interesting. Uh, yeah. Hopefully, in the near future. Yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, there's a there's an interesting thing you talk about um, binocular rivalry. 
um, where for, for people who don't know who's listening, uh, is when you show a different image, you know, to the to each eye, and you uh-huh. separate them, and the brain sort of sort of jumps between them, um, and you can't. Uh, I don't know. I think there are, are some cases where people see it as an overlap, but for the most part, uh, it seemed uncontrollable. And I was wondering if there's some correlation or some. Uh, I don't know if from your experience or you know about research. I and again, this touches on the sense of self. I think for me that in in a dream and especially in a lucid dream, um, I alternate often between uh, seeing it from first person and third person. But not only that, um, I I alternate between still uh, still seeing it from third person and being aware that it's a dream and I'm the person in bed or or identify with the this viewpoint from the sky. But I still identify with this guy running around, uh-huh. and uh, this is a rare opportunity to actually like play with the with the experience of sense of self and its fluidity and identification. Like, what do we identify with? Uh-huh. Uh, you can get rid of this little guy running around and still have a third person perspective. Right. What I've not been able to do is sort of do both at, at the same time, or at least I've not noticed that that's happening. I don't know if you you've ever experienced that in particular or have any thoughts about that. Yeah, that's a that's an interesting question. Um... It's tricky to know whether uh, I've definitely experienced the perspectives flipping back and forth. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've experienced that also in the context of out of body experiences as well. Um, the idea that you could hold both perspectives simultaneously, um, it seems hard to imagine. Right. Um, the, the, the tricky thing would be to be able to rigorously separate between um, a very rapid alternation between the two perspectives and a later memory consolidation of them as both at the same time. Whereas in binocular rival, we, we can really, um, uh, you know, get, get reports, um, in a way that, uh, in the dream state is, you know, the dream, the dream reports are always going to be retrospective except for the, you know, the eye movements in lucid dreaming. But even then Mm -hmm. the, relationship of the eye movement to what the intention was is going to be retrospectively reported upon awakening. So in the case of binocular images in general, um, we can track the activity better. And the case where some people see them as sort of superimposed or one behind the other is this study of of long-term Tibetan Buddhist meditators who in the case of a focused attention meditation were able to stabilize the image so that it either didn't shift to another one or this novel perception where they see one image as dominant, but the other one faintly behind it. So in a way, they're still seeing um, two distinct images. Um, they're just not switching in the, in the same way. So it's hard to know how that would work in the case of first person versus third person, that you could hold them both right. distinctly. Um, it seems rather that the nature of the perspectives is going to demand a kind of a kind of switch, whether you're in, in one or the other. And, and again, for all these things, the fact that we can't, uh, we can move our eyes, but we can't speak while we're lucid dreaming uh, and actually report live right. is, is so tricky. But it's, uh, yeah. it's interesting. A little uh, tangential question, if you don't mind. Um, uh, are there any studies that reveal, like, the, uh, I know that different meditations uh, show increase in, in performance of attentional tasks. Um, mm-hmm. Do different types of meditation been shown to show improvement in different different types of attentional tasks or something like that? Um, so the studies that I'm aware of mainly look at um, mindfulness versus focused attention meditation, where mindfulness is this open awareness where you're not selectively uh, attending to any particular thing and you're not sort of inhibiting or deselecting anything, whereas focused attention is you have a single chosen object of, of attention. And both of those types of practices have been shown to um, have effects on attentional performance. Um, both of those types of practices are used across different meditative traditions. So the, you know, the mindfulness, the term mindfulness is typically associated with Buddhism, but uh, especially as a result of different meditative practices influencing each other in the modern world, you know, you can find different lineages in which these things are both, are both done. So I would say that, um, that in general, either style of practice, let's say, um, 
where each you know tradition may emphasize one a little bit more than the other, but that either style of practice has 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 effects on attentional function. That there there are studies that that have shown that. Cool. Uh, so I want to I want to move uh, into some of the consciousness uh, and meditative uh, and perhaps more philosophical stuff uh, before we before we wrap up. So. Um, Let's see. So, so again, these are some of these questions are, are so overlapping. So, so hopefully this this will make sense. Um, you consider that meditative experience may develop qualities that are um, new rather than refine existing ones, like discrete versus uniform. Um, I often wondered if this is what happens to the sense of self, or or changes over time. Basically, what I'm what I'm thinking is like. I kept wondering in, in, in the descriptions about what happens in a meditative experience, not, not, I mean, over time, I kept wondering if we, are we developing a new way of experiencing consciousness or awareness or, or the sense of self, or are we basically dismantling or picking apart and seeing something more clearly? I don't know if that makes sense. I think I see what you're asking. Um, I mean, you're, you're asking if, if, let me see if I, if I understand you're asking, are we, are we creating something new or are we uncovering something that's already yeah. there? Yeah. Um, and I think that depends on what, on what it is that the person is doing. Um, um, some types of meditation practice, I think, or, or I would say actually in some ways it's both. So some types of meditation practice may lead to a cessation of um, autobiographical self-narrative thinking and when that has when that kind of cognitive processing is highly attenuated then another more let's call it kind of baseline level of awareness um, becomes predominant so the baseline level of awareness I take it is is as a baseline is is always there so in some sense you're uncovering something but the way that you're uncovering it is through altering your experience um, uh, in the sense that ordinarily um, we're caught up in autobiographical self-narrative cognitive processing and there's good reasons for that because you if you didn't have that you couldn't have the kind of social life that we human beings have so you're 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 changing things in the sense that you may be deconstructing or dismantling that and then you're revealing something that may be more basic and is always there but um you're doing that by altering the system you're, because you're 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 taking apart certain things that you know are are, are usually there. So then, um, some traditions will say some. So that's just a neutral way of describing things. Then some traditions will will place a kind of normative framework on that and say, well, the autobiographical narrative cognitive processing stuff that's delusory or um, the sticking to it is the cause of suffering and in revealing this baseline awareness that it doesn't have that kind of subject object structure you're uncovering something that's pure or pristine these are you know words that then people start using that have a kind of normative cast to them and that's um that's a, a kind of logical further step to go from the you know the descriptive characterization into a normative valuing of one thing over over the other. I mean that's a very big discussion because then that has to do with well what's the aim, um, in what sense is it uh, beneficial, in what sense might it have dangers, and and that's that's a big that's a big discussion. Yeah, I mean it, it's. It, I it's fascinating to me, and this is really, I think, a, a big part, if not the, the most the, the point of the book in some sense, is looking at the sense of self, asking if it's, you know, like, like some of these traditions as well as philosophers and even scientists uh, observe or, or claim that the self, the sense of self, or the self itself is, is some kind of an illusion or doesn't really exist and so on. And uh, first of all, I love your, your entire perspective of it and how you sort of lay... The whole the whole thing throughout the book to the culmination at the at the last chapter, and this is and this is what really interests me because until I started even reading about things like Buddhism and meditation, uh, and and I, I'm sure that this is the experience of a lot of other people who, ne who never even looked at it, um, is that I, I would never have considered the, the the sense of self to be or, or the experience of being a self to be anything as exactly as as it's perceived. 
Um, and even the descriptions of having the experience of no self, uh, even, even though you might not say that that's the, uh, particularly the goal, um, they, sound, they sound almost, I can't even imagine what that's like. And, and it's hard not to wonder, and maybe this is a question you, you can't answer, but feel free to, to uh, postulate about that, uh, is if there is an evolutionary advantage, if there is a reason for this coalescing of a sense of self or attributing everything in our experience to I, me, or mine, um, if that exists, quote unquote, for a reason or, or has a benefit, is, is messing or tinkering with it uh, a bad yeah. thing, a good thing? Or yeah, I think, I think that's an important question. I don't, I, I, my own view is that so the way that I put it in the book is that the self is a construction not an illusion and as a construction let's say it's a biological social construction the human sense of self the sense of self that we have as individuals with you know a personal history plans for the future and so on so that sense of self is um, is not an illusion it's a construction and there are aspects of it that can present in an illusory way and you can get stuck to those in a way that's unhelpful but the the sheer fact of the presence of a sense of self to me is is not illusory and it plays an important function so that taking it apart and dismantling it um, I don't think is uh, something that I would want to you know sign on sign on board to I think that that's um, that's kind of going against the grain of you know of our human form of life. Now, for some traditions, that's precisely the point. You want to, you know, the the the, the human situation is one of of uh, dissatisfaction or dukkha or suffering, and the extinguishing of that um, false sense of self, as as those traditions would describe it, is precisely the point. So that's again where we go into the area of ethics and normativity. And philosophy, where I would um, I would not want to you know subscribe to that to that project. Um, I think you know from my perspective, it's more a question of yeah. how to inhabit the human sense of self in a wholesome way, rather than to dismantle it. Yeah, and uh, I mean I, I love your description of sort of the self as a process. It reminds me of Kenneth Folks. Uh, also, I mean, this is sort of your take on what a qualified definition, perhaps, of enlightenment, and, and his definition is seeing experience as process, which I think in that includes the experience of self. Um, and, and I absolutely love the uh, analogy of like an image in a mirror. It's not that the image doesn't exist or that you don't see it, meaning the self is not real or, or doesn't exist, but that if you think that there is a person inside a mirror or... Right or you mistake the mirror for a glass and thinking there's a, there's a p person behind the window, that part is the illusion, the way you relate or think about it or, or experience it, not the experience itself, not the existence of that experience. Right, exactly, and, yeah. And I, and I think that that's where it also for me, why I'm fascinated by the concept of enlightenment or, or no self and or seeing self as, as something other than what we're sort of brought up. And I'm sure a lot of it is like language, how we talk about and use the word I and so on. Um, but for me, this is where it connects back to dreaming and lucid dreaming is because by the time I even first heard of this sort of concept or, or of enlightenment as, as anything, not even something mystical, but just a uh, subjective experience that happens, that can happen to someone, um, is, is when I suddenly realized I've had for years an experience of being in the world and taking it as real and taking the person running around in it as, as me and as real until I suddenly became lucid. And, and, and in almost in an instant, my pres not, not the content didn't change, but the, 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 just the awareness of it or the experience of it became so obvious, almost completely obvious to be something completely different. And so I said, okay, maybe, I don't know if it's like the micro and the macro being like the small dream and the big dream. And I know that's how it's described in some traditions, uh -huh. but it's just, uh, I couldn't help but, but wonder about enlightenment when I had this sort of micro awakening uh, in a, in a something else that wasn't what it was seemed what it seemed to be. Well, I, I think that's, you know, why the word awakening or, you know, buddhi in Sanskrit um, is a powerful metaphor is because people have the experience of being in a dream and either waking up in the dream or waking up from the dream and realizing, Oh, there's this, you know, larger context within which to understand things. 
and that's you know that's why the buddha is the awakened one is that he you know has this much larger context within which to understand things or why you know zhuangzi talks about the great awakening and maybe you know life is a dream and then there's the one who is you know everybody foolishly thinks it's real and then there's the one who's truly uh, awake and and sees it for what it is so so i mean that's you know go, getting back to your very first question about you know why human beings are so fascinated with dreams um i think that's one reason is the sense that the dream is so captivating and then there's this realization that oh actually there's a larger context within which you know to frame it um and and that's that's very um compelling immediately in a kind of non you know discursive way yeah um we're coming up on an hour and i, I have just uh uh, one more question. Um, the book, I think, has been out for about six months or so and probably was sort of sealed into going into production sometime before that. Um, has there any been any changes or any like studies or research that came out that, that uh, expands or, or interests you in some of these subjects that, that is new information? Yeah, so the book, let's see, the book came out about a year ago. Um, and of course, there was the, the writing time leading up to that. Um, there, in terms of the areas that I'm really kind of interested to see new research in, like deep sleep, lucid dreaming, um, there hasn't really been a lot of new work. There's the the Voss study you mentioned with the um, the uh, inducing of of lucid dreaming through the through the current stimulation. Um, there's been some studies of out of body experiences. Um, that are particularly interesting that if I were writing that chapter now, I would, you know, I would include those. Um, the state of the literature on near-death experience is pretty much the same as when I was writing. Uh, there isn't really a lot of new data there. There's, you know, an ongoing discussion of that topic that's, you know, across a whole range of voices, often, you know, uh, controversial um, um, across the near-death community, experience community, and then, you know, neuroscience. Um, but there's not really been a lot of, to my knowledge anyway, new kind of data in, in that subject. So um, not, not a lot that I, that I mean, I, I actually, I will say um, on the topic of um, whether perception is continuous or discrete that I talk about in chapter two, there, there has been some really interesting new data. There's been um, one study in particular that was published uh, just this year in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. And I wrote uh, a blog post about this for Psychology Today. So if people are people are interested in this, I, I've actually written two blog posts, one at the Brains blog and one at Psychology Today on this question of whether consciousness is continuous or discrete in waking perception. And there's a study um, that was published um, in Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences looking at tactile perception and brain rhythms, and it provides very strong evidence for a kind of discrete parsing of um of perceptual experience so that what appears as a kind of seamless continuum is upon closer analysis got kind of episodic pulses so that's that is new evidence that if i were writing that chapter today i would i would spend a fair amount of time on that experiment very interesting experiment yeah that's that's fascinating and i'll i'll uh, link to to those articles in the show note and to another article that you posted that that sort of i think is, is part of the book if i remember correctly but uh, one of one of the questions I see so so often, and I think you tackle just brilliantly and, and beautifully, um, is you know how do we know that we're actually lucid dreaming as opposed to just dreaming right. that we're having a lucid dream right. or dreaming I'm, the, the thought like hey this is a dream as opposed right. to actually knowing that it's a dream. Right. Um, and you you illustrated that that beautifully, and I'll, I'll link to that article as well. I think Great. that really just uh, solves that issue <laughs> so so well. <laughs> Uh, so it's been very useful. I've used that link uh, many a times. So uh, just to wrap up again, the the book is fantastic, and and I think that um, part of what part of what you do here, part of what I love about all of this and, and your work in general, is that for me it feels that um, philosophy is sort of remerging. And and again, I, I don't think philosophy ever left science. I know that science came out of philosophy originally, if I if I understand this the whole history correctly. But it seems that that the work, the kind of work that you do, and others like even um, um, 
uh, Sam Harris, whose book Waking Up has a lot of similarities every, everywhere from uh, tackling, uh, you know, near-death experience and looking at the evidence uh, to talk about the sense of self and neuroscience and philosophy and meditation combined. Um, in bringing back philosophy, what I call, for me, at the very least, I call uh, practical philosophy, philosophy that if you, um, you sort of dig into affects how you perceive yourself and life and, uh, and everything and, and can really change one's perspective. So I, again, I want to thank you for, for all of this. Um, what's, uh, what's next for you? Well, I'm not entirely sure. I'm, I'm working on a couple different projects that haven't really led into uh, concrete writing yet. Um, one of the things that, that, um, that I'm very interested in, in doing, and, I, and I'll, I probably will start writing on that very soon, is a book about death, um, very much growing out of the chapter on dying and death in, in waking, dreaming beings. So a more extended treatment of the meaning of death, especially from perspectives that are philosophical and, and contemplative. Um, so drawing on, say, Buddhism and, and uh, Stoicism and Hellenistic philosophy and, and Taoism as well, trying to uh, present a kind of cross-cultural philosophical perspective on the meaning of death. So that's, I, th I think that's probably going to be the next book, but um, stay tuned. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> all right. All right. That's good. Uh, so where can people find your material? I'm going to link to, to the book and, and let me know if there's a I hope I hope so. At some point, there's an audio book with, with you narrating it. Somewhere. Yeah, I'm not sure I'd be the best narrator, but uh, I I do want to encourage my publisher to to get an audio book out. Um, yeah, if people want to want to keep in touch with me, I have a Facebook author page. That I have you know a Twitter um, site. Um, my personal homepage is evanthompson.me. Uh, me. Um, so those are the best ways to to keep in touch with what I'm doing. Awesome. I'll, I'll link to those in the show notes. Great. So um, thank you really so much for your time and for coming on the podcast. Please continue doing what you're doing. It's, it's fantastic. And I, I can't get enough. Great. Of it. Well, thanks very much. Thank so much. Thanks a lot. Take care. All right. Bye-bye.